can do without you. The trustees will meet this morning after a worship service. Uh, we do have an important safety reminder regarding our nursery. Please remember, except for parents of nursery children, only those who have been trained and approved through the safety, safe sanctuary are to be in the nursery area. Thank you for your help and for operation of this important safeguard. Senior graduation Sunday will be celebrated on May the 21st. BBS will be June 23rd, uh, 22nd through, excuse me, 20th through 23rd from 5.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet available need for volunteers or helpers. Did you find it? No, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, you know where that is, sign-up sheet? Uh, I'm not sure. Somebody's got a sheet somewhere. But I'll we'll we'll check out. Again, all the Sunday school rooms are now open and ready for use. Come join the class Sundays at 9 a.m. And we need some help after the service this morning to move items from the baby nursery and the kitchen area to prepare for a carpet and tile being installed this week. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. And in case you, uh, in case you don't know or didn't catch today, it is a fifth Sunday, so it's our traditional worship Sunday. So we'll be doing hymns and some of the traditional parts of worship today, affirmation, things like that. So still follow along on the screens, and you'll probably be familiar with the hymns as well. We're going to start out by singing together, Rejoice the Lord is King. Let's stand as we sing together.
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So the ministry moment this morning, I just wanted to say we're in really good financial shape. And I wanted to kind of go over it with you just real quick and fill me that first slide up. So this is our first quarter. We brought a balance forward of about $22,000, a little over, and we ended up with a balance of about nineteen. This is our general fund and our account there. What's that next slide, Joe? And, and this is uh, the current balances for what you see up here is what's in the, in the checking accounts. Notice the total assets, $428,000, 12342 There. And, oh, go back, Joey. Take off on me yet. And then on the other side, you see the designated giving. This is money that is actually set aside. We can't touch it except for what it's, what it's labeled for there. And if we take the designated giving out of there, it gives us a balance of about 409000 almost 410000 there. Okay? Just to kind of give you an idea, go ahead and throw that next one up. Um, we still owe uh, a final bill to the Hudax, and the insurance money will cover that. We're still waiting for another insurance check to come in before we pay off the balance. Uh, we sold the property for $2 million over in Rainbow City. We bought this for $209,189. That left us that same balance which you saw earlier. Okay? Now, uh, the other thing I want you to know is that all of this information is on the website, on the membership page. And you should have gotten an email during the week that had this information in it too. Okay? So I wanted to kind of be clear. We weren't doing this for a while because everything kind of was getting juggled. We were waiting for the contractors to get finished, waiting for insurance money to come in, waiting to buy, waiting to sell, you know. <coughs> so it wasn't something that we could give you firm numbers on. And we will firm up an actual projected buzz budget in a couple of months. It will take about a quarter for us to see the bills come in and see how much they're going to be. And then we'll give you a Joe, firm we'll that next slide. He's talking yeah. about that. So, uh, we, we, we'll get a proposed budget together. This is kind of a general proposed budget, and I didn't want to put the whole budget on there. You wouldn't be able to see it. It would be too little. But anyways, we brought forward the 22. We're expecting giving to be about 315000 this year. We expect to pay bills of about 300000 and leave us with about $31,000 at the end of the year. Those are all probable, possible numbers, okay? But we'll get all of it put together and we'll have a, a better understanding of everything in a couple of months here to and give you a really better projected budget than what I'm giving you right now. Now everybody knows, okay? It's clear, as clear as I can make it. Okay, now you know everything I know. All right? Okay. Um, should I do? No, we're oh, all <laughs> At the cross, let's stay at the same
42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the, might, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let us pray. God, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day and for the opportunity to gather together today in your house and worship and praise you. Lord, you are worthy of all of our praise, and we just thank you that we can come together today. And Lord, uh, just continue to be with this church as we go forward. We just thank you for the leadership of Pastor Mark and just um, help us to be the church that we need to be in this community and the church that you want us to be in this community. And Lord, be with us as we go through this week. Help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus everywhere we go to share love and kindness with everyone. And Lord, just um, be with Pastor Mark as he brings the, the message this morning. Open our ears and our hearts to receive your word. And Lord, I just ask that you bless the tithes and the offerings this morning and use them to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have the ushers come forward, please. As a forgiving to reconcile people, let us offer our tithes and gifts to the Lord's act of worship. Holy Father, bless them. Bless the people that give. Thanks, guys. Memories they uncover become the light 
So I come to you this morning in Jesus' name, just in case you're wondering. And I really believe in that last hymn that we sang. I think he gave everything to me freely, and I am supposed to give it away freely. And I also think that he has forgiven me for too much to judge anybody else. And, and that's the truth of how I feel. That's my own personal opinion. And, and I will tell you when it's really my personal opinion. We're going to talk about John 10, 1 through 10 this morning. Um, so I'm wondering, have I talked to you about love lately? Maybe I should talk again about love this morning. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit this morning too. Um, we'll start with the Good Shepherd, was, which is Jesus. He is definitely the perfect pastor. Okay? And, and yes, I know he knows that all of us pastoral leaders are human and, and we're not the perfect pastors and that we have frailties and shortcomings. I realize he knows that. Um, and I'm just thankful that Jesus himself doesn't have any of these instabilities. Okay? And that's what I'm thankful for this morning. And that's why he alone is our friend. Okay? And if you hear somebody that's trying to point to themselves instead of Jesus, walk out of the room. Okay? Because that's not a good shepherd. That's not a good pastoral leader. If he's pointing to anything besides Jesus, or if she's pointing to anything besides Jesus, then they're pointing in the wrong direction. See, the good shepherd does this for us. He gives us all an opportunity to be in love and fellowship, <coughs> no matter what kinds of differences or divisions we have. Okay? Let's talk about that this morning. Before we go, let's pray our way in. If you bow your heads, join your hearts with me. So, Good Shepherd, I just come to you this morning. Do you know us by our own names? Do you know us by our own identities? Nothing of us is hidden from you. So we ask this morning that, that you gather us to you. You as the Good Shepherd gathers the sheep that, that we might be in your will and speak your name into our lives. Lord Jesus, in your mercy, we ask that you hear our prayers. We ask that you open up our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and meet our very souls. <coughs> Sorry, we got a tickle. <clears throat> we hope that you get me completely out of the way and that you give everybody the message this morning that you want to give. <coughs> May it be in your name. Amen. Amen. So John 10, 1 through 10, the parable of the Good Shepherd. Um, I assure you, Jesus says, you, and most solemnly say to you that he who does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up from some other place on a stone wall, that one is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, the protector and the provider. The doorkeeper opens the gate for this man and the sheep hear his voice and pay attention to it. And knowing that, they listen. He calls his own sheep by their name and leads them out to pasture. When he has brought all of his own sheep outside, he walks ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice and recognize his call. They will never follow a stranger, but will run away from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they didn't understand what he was talking about. So G Jesus said again, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, I am the door for the sheep leading to life. All who came before me as false messiahs and self-appointed leaders are thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not hear them. I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and will live forever and will go in and out freely and find pasture that is spiritual security. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance till the full, till it overflows. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Uh, the image of the Good Shepherd is a, it's a stable image in our Christian theology. You know, 
we see these artistic renderings of it most of the time. And, and what is it? It's this like, very serene scene, right? And, and there's this hard-working shepherd, and he's got this docile sheep strapped over his shoulders, and he's walking around. And that's what comes to mind when I think of a good shepherd, right? Uh, the shepherd, it, he is a shepherd that cares for the sheep. He'll leave the 99 to go find the one lost sheep. Uh, the shepherd feeds, the shepherd protects the sheep, and, and is he even willing to risk his own life for each and every one of those sheep. He leads them beside still waters. He anticipates their every need, even those who, who the needs that we haven't even thought of yet. He, he anticipates those for us, right? He takes them along the way, and sometimes the long way, to avoid any dangers in the passage. Even if he's exhausted, the shepherd will not rest until he is satisfied that all the sheep are safe. And well, and this Christ-like image of a shepherd, it, it really, it doesn't bear a lot of resemblance to real life shepherds, okay? Who, who are well aware of dangers of taking care of animals and are daily acquainted with life and death choices. Now, farmers and shepherds, they're forced to make choices about what's good on the balance, you know, which may in fact require leaving an animal behind to protect the rest of the animals, right? Even the best farmer or shepherd knows that the whole farm and the well-being of the family is at risk if he dies trying to do the job. So try as they do, even the wisest farmer or shepherd can't avoid difficult and dangerous situations or anticipate everything that the animals are going to do. They know that the animals sometimes will become sick, and sometimes they'll refuse to do what's best for their own health and well-being even. And sometimes they'll even die because of it, right? And, and that's what it means to care for animals. When, when you do care for animals, you have to accept some loss of animals. There's life and death in the balance of taking care of them. Still in our Christian imagination and piety, we hold on dearly to this image of Jesus as a good shepherd. Although we know it's an impossible standard for our, our spiritual leaders to hold. We know that that's not something that they can do naturally. Right? Jesus is the good shepherd is what we imagine our, our pastors are going to be like. And the way he cares for us, that's the way that we think our pastors are going to care for us too. You know? Caring for the flock means working overtime to ensure safety and that each individual person is taken care of. Sometimes that requires risking everything just to bring the good news to the sheep. You know? I would like to think that I'm that kind of pastor, but I am not that naive. Nor am I that self-important. I realize I do the best I can do, and I pray all the time about it, and I point, hopefully, in a good direction. We know this image doesn't really align with the humanity of real pastors, right? That Jesus is an example that we fall short of. We only need to remember those that have fallen short, you know. Who can I? Uh, Jim Baker. <laughs> and our pity for Tammy, when that all fell apart, right? And there's there's several other I, I could mention, but there's no point, you know, after that, really. Yeah. Unfortunately, what we have is in these kind of stories, it, 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 it makes people kind of skeptical of religious organizations. It makes people kind of skeptical of going to church. It makes people kind of skeptical of pastors and, and what they're trying to do. And perhaps even rightfully so sometimes, you know? However, it should come no surprise that Christian leaders fall to the, to the same kind of, you know, temptations and human frailties that everybody else does because, because pastors are human beings, right? We know that that's true. And they're certainly not Jesus. Try as they might. 
right? They can only point in a direction to the true foundation. That's all we can do. We can only say, here's Jesus, and here's what I know about him. And this is, this is the direction I want to point all the time. But at last, you know, we're people just like any other person. No, I haven't done anything wrong, but I, I've done this sermon before, and I think I, after church I had about five people come up and say, what did you do, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing that I know of, yeah, okay. <laughs> Although we have every right to expect our spiritual leaders to be good guys that are pointing us in the right direction, that, that are, that are going to do good things for us, they're not going to defraud us. And we can expect them to uh, uh, be a good leader. They're never going to be a replica of Jesus. And they're certainly not going to be a replacement. Okay? Because there's only one firm foundation. There's only one good shepherd. There's only one Jesus. And we can try as we might, but we're not the cornerstone. There's only one of those. And that's Jesus Christ Himself. Now in the parable of Good Shepherd, we see Jesus not only in that pastoral leadership role, but He's also the only way, the only gate that the sheep can come in. Now, in case you've never heard me say it, I believe there's only one way. And that is through Jesus Christ. There's only one way to eternal life. That's it. Now, I like to hope that that opportunity to accept that as the only way happens more than once in life for everybody. And I like to hope that when somebody is on their deathbed and they haven't accepted Jesus yet, that there's some opportunity that happens for them. Even if we don't see it. This is how I feel my God will react to each and every one of us. To give us every opportunity. You see, Jesus not only leads the way to life as the shepherd often does, He is the way to life. He is Himself life and the giver of life because he's Jesus. He's the, he's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's sent by God. In fact, if you're willing to believe it, he is God. Just come in corporeal form for us to interact with. Jesus leads the way to eternal life and even gives up his own life in doing so. The most, the most any human leader can hope for is just simply to point in the direction of Jesus Christ. That's the best we can do. That's the most and the best I can do for you is to just keep pointing toward the Good Shepherd, the one who leads to the way of life, the one who is life himself. Because he is both the shepherd and the gate. He's both of those things. Using the metaphor of Jesus' parable as a human pastor, it is also a, a reminder that I'm a sheep. And that I need Him as much as you need Him. Right? Hopefully, a lead sheep that, that keeps him pointing the good direction, you know. And hopefully I've got my eyes open enough so that when I'm looking, I can see the good sheep and hear the good shepherd's voice. Right? And I can point you away from people who are not good shepherds and point you towards the good shepherd itself. That I can hear the voice and know. Because you know, uh, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of leaders, religious leaders nowadays, that, that say they speak for Jesus. And, and, the, and the simple truth is not all of them do. And I am not qualified to judge any. All I can say is, I want to guide you to the shepherd. The good one. Even so, pastors need the guidance of leadership of Jesus. And, and not only that, but we need other sheep to be guiding us and leading us too. 
I've heard this several times, it takes a whole congregation to raise a pastor. <laughs> and I have been raised by some good congregations, man. I'm telling you what. I really have. See, because I know that, that we too can fall victim to the thieves and the bandits just as easily as the other sheep. Our world is full of people who proclaim that they are the good shepherd. And, and these people can sometimes be difficult to spot. And they're oratory can sometimes be so persuasive that we just fall into that belief that yes, they must be right because they sound like they're right. Yeah? In my opinion, you heard that, right? In my opinion, usually there is no ambiguity in what they say. See, they, they state things in black and white, right? It's either this way or you're going to hell, right? Now, they, they definitely offer a clear stance on all the controversial issues, making it very simple to see what's right and what's wrong. That's right in front of you, right? And they'll take all the topics. They'll go gun control, abortion, death penalty, human sexuality. And they, they are so smart of a shepherd that they've solved all these problems for us. Right? And it's, it's quite clear that they've solved all the problems and we just need to listen to them because they're right. And the right answer seems so clear. Although when we, we put it into practice, we find out that all of these issues are kind of thorny in real life examples. They're, they're kind of difficult. They don't, they don't have these, these clear cut obvious solutions. Now our culture itself today has been divided along these lines and and at any given moment, I can hear somebody say they're pro this or anti that. In any given situation. You know? It gives us this false impression that everything is binary. That there's only this choice or this choice that can be made. And the truth is a lot deeper. And any conversation that you have on any of these topics can bring out all the uncertainties that are involved in it. See, even brief, superficial dialogue will uncover that human lives, what we generally live, is difficult. It's messy. True human lives are that way. They're sufficiently unpredictable. Okay? I'm sure of it. And, and it's not ever simple. It's never just twofold. It's never just this way or that way. It doesn't matter what choice you're making. We are each complicated organisms. And, and the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ, He knows this about us. He recognizes this in each one of us. He sees you as you, knows your name, knows the hairs on your head, knows what's going on in your life, how you're dealing with it, and knows the right way to help you. The Good Shepherd, he opens the gate and he offers a pathway out of this binary loop that continue to put us at odds with each other. The Good Shepherd, he offers this third way. It's, it's unconventional. You know? When, when we give our divisions a rest for long enough, enough to look up and see who we really are following, we realize something quite plainly. We're all his followers. His flock. Right? And we suddenly realize that we're all sheep following Jesus. If we could see that one thing, then we could be okay with the ways that we're divided. Right? We could find ways to live in love with each other. I did not say agree. Alright? I didn't say that at all. I didn't say give up on what you believe. I didn't say that either. I said agree to disagree and live in love. This is a different thing. This is not the same as being argumentative and demonizing somebody. All right? See, I keep this standing rule. 
that if it's Scripture, I tell you it's Scripture. But if it's a personal opinion of Mark, I also say, hey, this is my opinion. I think this way. And I don't think that way easily. And I am not easily shaken. If you want to change my mind on something, you better make a good argument. Because I'm stubborn, too. You know, I'll believe it, believe it, believe it until you can really prove it to me. You know, and, and I expect, encourage each one of you to check every scripture I read, to check everything I say. Because I am not arrogant enough to think I have all the right answers. I know, Dave, sometimes it seems like I do. <laughs> I know. But I do expect you to keep checking to make sure that what I say to you aligns with our firm foundation, Jesus Christ. Right? I, I want you to always check it. I also know that I am only one part of the body of Christ. And that I can't do any of this by myself. It isn't Mark is always leading and guiding. It's I share the leadership and the guidance with a bunch of other servant leaders. And I call them my Christian family. Their name is Christ Central Church. And just to make sure you understand why I think that, I'll read scripture. I lean on 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 13. I lean on 1 Corinthians 12, 24 through 27. I, I lean on it. Complete. And this is what it reads. Now there are a variety of gifts for the same Spirit. And there are a variety of ministries in the same Lord. There are a variety of effects but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. And to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healings by the same one Spirit, and to another affecting miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same Spirit work all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. For just as the body is one, yet has many parts, and all the parts of the body Though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one Spirit. See, Paul continues this in, in verse 27 saying, Now you are Christ's body, and individually parts of it. So I'm a part, and you're a part. And when somebody doesn't show up or doesn't come, we're missing a piece. So if you know somebody who's not here this morning, tell them we're missing a piece of the part of our body that's necessary. And tell them we need them next Sunday. Okay? We need them. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one Spirit. Paul continues. Now you are Christ's body and individually parts of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, and various kinds of tongues. And he goes on to say that all are not apostles, are they? No. And all are not prophets, are they? And all are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles. All do not have gifts of healings, do they? And all do not speak in tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the great, greater gifts. And yet, I'm going to show you a far better way. Then he goes on to 1 Corinthians 13. Now I'm going to read 4 um, through 13 for you. And I live by this. This is how I live my life. And it doesn't matter if I'm, if I'm dealing with a believer or an unbeliever, with somebody who agrees with me or with somebody who disagrees with me. It does not make a difference. 
This is how I live life. Love is patient. It's kind. It's not jealous. It doesn't brag. It's not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It's not provoked. It does not keep an account of wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It keeps every confidence. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts and prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part and prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, then like a, think like a child, reason like a child. And when I became an adult, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I, I, as I also have been fully known. But now there's the three, faith, hope, and love that remain. These three, but the greatest of these three is love. See, when I hear somebody say that they know it, all I remember the last part of that scripture. That that's not possible. That can, because of where we are now in time, that we only see partially. The ceiling of complete understanding is beyond us. So those people kind of frighten me, especially when they're leading others. They kind of frighten me a little bit. I'll give you a thought. I like to base all of my perceptions on love. And when we base our perceptions of others on love, that's the moment that the gate of life opens wide. And it becomes clear that we can all move in the same direction. We could cross the same threshold and go in the same places, even if we disagree on something. But I have to go back and make sure that I'm basing my perception of that person on love. <coughs> and I want you to think about that for a second. How does Jesus see you? What's his perception? Is it not in love? So a pathway becomes available to another way of being in a community where each life is valued simply because it's lived, when I look at that life in the perception of love. You see, the good shepherd not only points the way, but he is the way to the kingdom of God, where we're each known by our name and valued just as we are. He doesn't wait for our sin to be settled. Jesus says, I'll take you now, today, This parable, it just offers us a vision for the kind of leadership and community that really seem almost impossible in the world today. We are so at odds with each other. Lord, help us through it. I can guarantee you this. Nobody's got it all right. Nobody. I have lived firsthand the pain we as Christians sometimes can unintentionally cause each other. I have seen people walk away from the church <laughs> because of it. <clears throat> Lord, may we never be there again. Ever. Real and traumatic harm can come at the hands of the people we are encouraged to trust the most. See, the Good Shepherd acknowledges this, and there is no doubt the church is filled with hurt souls and sinners. Aren't we all? In some way or another. So when another hurt soul or sinner walks through the door, I think it's time for us to say welcome. 
See, we usher in the kingdom of God when we choose to walk a path of faith, hope, and love. One that offers us redemption and healing and forgiveness and allows us to offer the same redemption, healing, and forgiveness. Now, we come closer to experiencing the kingdom of God when we treat each other with respect and acknowledge the immense complexity of each human life. It's so intricate is this human life that God is the only one that can truly understand our pain and joy, the pain and joy of each individual soul. God is the only one that can truly understand that. The miracle of Easter is that no human law, no human king, no human justice system, not even an angry mob can kill the Spirit of God. Nothing can kill that spirit. That spirit endures. That foundation is firm. It goes on. Jesus' triumphant return that first Easter morning was proof to all the disciples, past, present, and future, that we can lean deep into divine love. And there is no risk that's too big to take from that. No risk. Imagine then what a kingdom full of people who are willing to trust God's love can do. Imagine who they can reach. Imagine that. We could risk it all. We could lay down the swords on which our battles and differences balance. And let them go. And keep pointing to Jesus. And just saying, okay, well, all that's important right now is that you know Jesus. All that's important right now is that you know Jesus. Let me say it again. All that's important right now is that you know Jesus. Because you and I are not going to fix anybody. But He will. He'll pour out His Spirit in a way that anybody can be repaired. Anybody can be brought in. That's why we keep pointing to Him. And then we can acknowledge that each of us was born in love, cast in the image of love, and lives on the promise of love from God. But what kind of world would that be? What kind of church would that be? So I give you love. No matter who you are. Because that's my job as a Christian. To give love. To see people in love. I hope you're able to glean something from that this morning. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. David? Let's band and sing with us. I swear to God.
son, Dixie, you know what I pray for you? I pray that he's before you and behind you. He's above you and underneath you to your right and to your left. And you're rising in the morning and you're going to sleep at night. I pray that you hear his voice. I pray that he speaks your name to you. And he says, my child, I pray that for you. Because when I'm really broken, that's what he does for me. I can hear him say, Mark, it's going to be okay, child. You know? It blesses my soul to be with you each Sunday morning. I thank you for being here. And I do want you to remind other people we need them. We need every part of the body of Christ to serve this community. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Peace.